for urban horticulture. And uh, I also coordinate the Master Gardener Volunteer Program. So we may have some Master Gardeners on the call today. And if there are some Master Gardeners from my county or other counties or even outside of Florida, I just want to say thank you for being a volunteer. All right, so um, without further ado, uh, we'll go ahead and start talking about good bugs and bad bugs. You will also get a copy of this presentation, and I have some excellent handouts for you, a publication on natural pest control. I've got some links to some wonderful resources on where to find information on the web. And I also have a handout on how to do a soap plush technique, which we will talk about a little bit later in the presentation. So you can take notes. Uh, that's how I personally learn, but don't feel compelled to have to write everything down because you will be getting all of this information after the webinar. Okay, give me one moment just to fix my screen. All right, so the first thing when we're talking about insects and bugs and potential pests in the garden is you wanna make sure that you identify the pest. And this can be a little bit difficult to do if you're not really familiar with entomology or insects, but you have a lot of resources. Um, there's great resources online. There's shared information, Facebook pages that can be helpful, your extension office, master gardener volunteers, friends and neighbors are all um, potentially able to help you identify a pest. But I wanna hear from you all. Why do you think it's important to properly identify a pest? And if you would like to give me your comments or feedback, go ahead and use the chat box. And I'll wait a few moments for people to type in their answers. So why is it important to properly identify a pest? So Shannon says that many bugs are beneficial to plants. That's great. Mary uh, posted, so you do not kill good bugs. Very good, I'm happy to hear that. Some of them aren't bad to protect beneficials. A few folks understand that pollinators are very important. So we want to be cognizant of what we're doing in our gardens and um, reducing harm to non-target organisms and our pollinators because they are very important. Uh, you don't wanna kill a good bug. If we kill all bugs, um, that could be beneficial to plants and the environment, um, then we're actually you know, harming the bugs that are doing their part to keep our gardens healthy. Uh, so lots of uh, great feedback and comments about why it's important. And I put pests in parentheses or in quotes here because pests really can be uh, referred to many different things. It could be an insect, it could be a weed, it could be a disease problem, it could be a fungus. And so if we're not properly identifying that pest, then we could be using resources or putting uh, chemicals down that might not be um, matched to what we're trying to control. So this is part of a process called integrated pest management, or we call it IPM for short. The University of Florida has, an ex has excellent resources on integrated pest management. If you wanna dive a little bit deeper, and I will send you links to those after the webinar, um, there is integrated pest management for all kinds of things. Um, for household pests like cockroaches, there are integrated pest management uh, strategies for things like mole crickets and chinch bugs. And by using an integrated pest management approach, what we're looking at are kind of all of the factors that are contributing to the pest. We're trying to minimize harm to non-target organisms, matching controls, and monitoring the area a to C, do we A, have a pest infestation? Because we all know we're never going to get rid of all bugs. So trying to get rid of everything to 100% is unrealistic and actually can contribute to resistance in insects. Um, but also, there are things called thresholds. And I see Michael has done a great job of putting that in the comments. Uh, let's say that you pull up a piece of turf grass in your yard, a section of it, and you see grubs in your soil. Well, if you have a few grubs, that's no big deal. It's really not something that you need to treat. But if you have many grubs and what we would consider a high threshold or infestation, then that is the time that you want to put down a method for control. So excellent point, Michael. Thank you for doing that. Um, also, you know, you want to know what you're dealing with. So if we have something like an aphid, for example, you as a homeowner, 
and a home gardener have a lot of options on how to control aphids. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about less toxic methods and what options are available to you. Um, personally, if I have a, a, a wide repertoire of things that could work for insect and pest control, I will start off with the less toxic methods first. And then if I need to get something that could be a little stronger or systemic, I'll try that. It depends on the infestation, it def depends on the pest, and it depends on what we're trying to control. So excellent comments. Thank you all for posting those in the chat box. All right, so we're gonna go through some steps for integrated pest management. Again, as we mentioned before, this is the first thing to remember, properly identify the pest. And if you don't know what something is, ask for assistance from your local extension office. Um, the links that I'm going to send you, let's say for instance, you're a vegetable gardener. We have some really great resources that are available for free online, um, where maybe if you have a disease on a vegetable plant and you're not sure what it is, uh, you can use these resources to compare photos of what you see in your garden to what are posted online and maybe match it up to the disease or the pest or a nutrient deficiency, for example. So you don't have to try to figure this out alone. You have tools and resources and we'll help you with that. You also want to get out in your garden and monitor and scout for pests. So I'll tell you a story of a homeowner in my area and I'm in the Tampa Bay area, Tampa um, and Hillsborough County. And we had a homeowner who lived on Davis Islands, which is right outside downtown Tampa. And she called me at the extension office. And some of you may have heard the story before, but I like to share it because it's an example of a person doing everything right. Um, she had muley grass planted in her garden. And for those of you who, who know your plants, you know that muley grass is a native plant. It's very easy to grow. It's very drought tolerant, and it doesn't have a lot of pests. So she called me at the extension office and she said, Nicole, I have these white bugs all over my muley grass. So I was intrigued because I know that muley grass is pretty disease and pest free. Um, I actually did a site visit to go to her house and figure out what she had on her muley grass. Now, the first thing that's really important to note is that she was out in her yard and she was noticing what was different. So we call that scouting and monitoring. And sometimes just that simple practice is one of the best steps for integrated pest management. Being out in your garden, recognizing what's normal, knowing what's not normal, um, that can really help you to figure things out quickly. And if you do have an issue or a problem that you need to address, it's a lot easier to do that when you first spot it than after a lot of damage has been done. So I went out to her landscape and did the site visit. And lo and behold, she did have these white bugs all over her muley grass. Um, what was interesting is that the ones that she noticed were not the pests. And the ones that she noticed are in this presentation. And I'll show you a picture of them in a minute. Um, but she noticed, noticed muley bug destroyers, which are a very good uh, beneficial insect. The problem was that at the bottom of the muley grass, she had a muley bug. And this pest was kind of at the crown or the base of the muley grass. And the one that she thought was the bad insect, which turned out to be good, the muley bug destroyer, was eating the muley bugs at the base of the muley grass. So there is a particular type of muley bug that doesn't even have a common name, it just has a scientific name and it will attack muley grass. So it was very interesting to learn this. She learned a lot. Um, and then what, what did we do? We said, let's just leave it alone and see if the muley bug destroyers do their job and call me in about a month or so and let me know if there's been any changes. So she called me in about a month or so and said, you know what? I don't have any issues with the muley grass. It looks fine. And in this particular case, um, because she, knew something wasn't normal, so she was scouting. She identified the pest. We waited because we knew it was a beneficial and we were prepared to act, but in this case, we didn't have to because the muley bug destroyers did their job. So it was very cool and we enjoyed uh, learning something new. The other reason why integrated pest management is important is as we mentioned earlier, you wanna match the control to the pest or problem. This is something I see a lot at Extension where we have uh, homeowners who have turf grass issues. 
and they'll call the extension office and the first thought might be that it's chinch bugs or mole crickets, but many times it's a disease or a fungal problem. And so you can understand that if uh, you think that it's a, an insect problem and you're putting down a control for chinch bugs or mole crickets, and it actually is a fungal issue, we're not matching the control to the pest. We're actually putting down product that is unnecessary. And we could see some of these issues on an annual basis if we don't know how to manage it properly. So matching the control to the pest or problem can um, not only have environmental impacts and benefits, it can actually save you as the homeowner time and it can save you money. So when possible, as we mentioned earlier, we wanna use the least toxic method of control and we wanna rotate a mode of action and products. Uh, mode of action is basically, um, you look at the active ingredient of different products and they work differently on different stages of insects life cycles. And we can help you figure out an appropriate mode of action. We can also help you figure out how to start with the least toxic method. But as I said, I will send you an excellent publication that has that information and some suggestions for least toxic controls to start with first. Um, so can any of you think of some least toxic um, pesticides because technically they are pesticides, even though they might be considered safer or more organic, they are pesticides. Um, do any of you know of some least toxic pesticides that you could use on many insect problems in a home garden? Neem oil, excellent. Uh, someone sent that to me. Yes, neem oil, very good. Diatomaceous earth, boric acid, soap and water, insecticidal soaps would be appropriate. So that's a great suggestion as well. Uh, you might see horticultural oils. That's another good one that you could put down. Um, so yes, BT, that one, there's many different kinds of BT, even with neem, uh, there's different active ingredients in neem. So not all neem oils are the same. Uh, that's gonna be in that publication on the natural products. Uh, I encourage you to really take a look at the neem oil section, just to learn a little bit more about the active ingredients in different neem products because they aren't all the same. So very good, you were already familiar with some of the least toxic methods that you could start with. And in general, just uh, follow the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles when you're working in your garden. These are good overarching principles um, for landscape design, inviting wildlife, fertilizing appropriately, saving water, you can read more about all of them at this link, but um, following the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles is just a great approach uh, for home gardens. All right, and the main thing is you wanna practice at home. So just like the story I told you of the homeowner who contacted me about the muley grass, um, this happened to me recently. So I've been working from home, especially during uh, the early years or early time, uh, early months of COVID-19 and last year. And I was out in my garden more than I have been previously. And I started to notice something in my backyard. So I'm gonna share a personal story of how I use this IPM approach. So I was out in my yard and I saw these eggs on the bottom of a beautyberry bush. And they were laid on the underside. I thought they were very distinct looking. It was two lay eggs laid on the underside of the leaf um, they almost looked like a drop of glue was dropped on the leaf. I had never seen them before and I thought they were very interesting. So I took this on as a little experiment just for myself to learn what they were, to try to identify them and find out what hatched from these eggs. Does anyone know what these are? And if you don't, that's okay because we're gonna talk about it. I, I didn't know what they were. All right, so what I did Butterfly eggs, that's a great guess. And I'm a butterfly gardener and these were laid in the area near my butterfly plants, but they're not butterfly eggs. So we're gonna find out in just a moment. Uh, so what I did is over the period of a couple of weeks, I would just go in my backyard, take a look at these eggs, see if there were any changes, try to figure out what was going on. And I noticed that over time, the eggs completely turned color. So they started off as these little creamy, almost look like drops of glue on the bottom of the leaf. And then they changed into more of a reddish orange color with a red stripe completely down the top of the egg. 
So completely different color at a different stage of its life cycle. So when you're looking for pests, and even if you're a butterfly gardener, you know this, um, you can identify insects sometimes by flipping the leaves and looking under the leaf. You can see where the eggs are laid. Are they on the upper side? Are they on the underside? Are they laid in a single egg, laid in a cluster of eggs, a group? What color are they? Are there patterns on the eggs? If you've ever seen a harlequin bug egg, it, they look like little barrels laid on different cruciferous crops. So the egg itself is very um, indicative of what the, the pest might be. So sometimes you can get some really good clues. Uh, this one I didn't know. So I was looking at it for a few weeks and then um, you could see in the picture on the left that the egg turned red with that red stripe down the back of it. So it was a reddish orange color. And lo and behold, they hatched into leaf-footed bugs. Uh, these are not beneficial insects. They are actually a pest. Um, but in my case, um, you know, each of us garden and the role of the University of Florida and IFIS and Master Gardener Volunteers, our role is to provide the options and then you can make the best decision for your landscape. So in my case, this is me speaking personally, um, I just let them be. There were only two of them. I knew that they were right next to my bird feeder. So I was hoping that perhaps they might become food for birds. And in the whole experience, I learned something new. Um, there is a website that I use, uh, Bugwood, and I believe it's through the University of Georgia. And many of us in Extension use it for the pictures of the insects. Um, I did notice on their site that they did not have pictures of this particular stage, of the early stage. So I will try to see if I can submit the pictures of the eggs because I think they have these photos, but not from the very early stage. So you can learn something new. Gardening is a lot of fun. It's an experiment. And this is just another example of how you can easily implement IPM. And the way I identified it is I just started looking for eggs and when I found the leaf-footed bugs, then I could go back and properly identify the eggs based on what they hatched out into. All right, so uh, we're gonna go through a couple of different critters real quick. And I will uh, ask that you could type in the chat box if you think it's good or bad, and then we'll give you the examples. And Mary has asked in the chat box if I can give the website with the photos of the bugs, and I will. Um, I will say that the website is somewhat scientific. It's just got pictures and then people post almost like a forum or thread of what they find. And um, I use it as a reference tool. So I will definitely send that out to all of you. Okay. Yes, yeah, so many of you know that this is a good critter. This is a, as Mary has said, a baby ladybug. So Mary, you are correct. Um, this is a lady beetle larvae. You'd be surprised that we do get calls at extension for people who have found this in their gardens and they don't know what it is. Uh, so they're wondering, is this a good critter or a bad critter? Of course, we say this is good. Leave it alone in your garden. Um, this is also a great one to talk to kids about because as you all know, uh, the lady beetle larvae's larvae look very different at different stages of their life cycle. So from the egg to the larva, to the pupa, to the adult ladybug, they look very, very different. This is another reason why I appreciate integrated pest management because it just gets you out noticing your yard and you start to learn, even just as that example with the leaf-footed bug, that insects can look very different at different stages of their life cycle. So there's a lot to learn, but it is interesting. It's, it's really kind of cool. And if you need any help, reach out to Extension or um, local gardeners, garden clubs, and see if you can get some assistance. So ladybugs can eat between 200 and 500 aphids during their larval stage. Um, during the larval stage is when they're really voracious eaters. So if you can encourage them to your garden, this is a great beneficial insect to have. But these are good. And remember I talked about the mealybug destroyer that the gardener on Davis Islands found. So this is a picture of the mealybug destroyer larvae. Um, it's the middle picture, that kind of big white uh, furry looking thing that actually does not look very good. <laughs> this is what she initially found all over her muley grass. And on the right hand side, you can see that the mealy bug destroyer larvae 
will turn into the mealybug destroyer adult. And it actually is a black lady beetle. So in the picture on the right, that adult mealybug destroyer lady beetle is eating a mealybug. So it might be a little bit confusing, but um, at first glance, the one in the middle is our good insect. The one on the far left is a mealybug. And the picture on the right has your adult mealybug destroyer lady beetle eating a mealybug. So Kelly is asking a great question. Is the larva larger in length than the adult stage? It's not, it's smaller, a little bit smaller. Um, but the difference is, is that the mealybug destroyers are very active. They're predators and, and they're looking for food and other insects to eat. So you will see them kind of moving around. They don't stay sedentary. Uh, that's a clue that you may not be working with a pest insect. The mealybugs, on the other hand, do tend to stay more sedentary. They're clustered. They don't move as fast. Um, but if you ever find a mealybug destroyer, consider yourself to be very lucky because they are very cool if you can find them in your landscape. I know we have some cardboard palms here at the extension office, and when we have found the mealybugs, the mealybug destroyers on the cardboard palms, usually they're eating scale, um, we have collected them and put them at the front desk so that people can see them. And almost, you know, we, we put them as a superstar status because we want people to see that at first glance, they look like they could be a pest, but they're actually very helpful to your garden. All right, thanks everyone for, um, for playing along on that one. Here's another one. I think most of us um, should be able to agree that this one we consider a pest. And this is a Eastern lover grasshopper. Uh, grasshoppers are typically attracted to certain kinds of plants like lilies and crinums, amaryllis. So if you have these plants in your landscape, you'll often see them um, laying eggs and coming back year after year after year. I personally don't want to get rid of my favorite plants. And so I have to deal with the grasshoppers and I know that they're part and parcel with the uh, plants that I have in my landscape. I have noticed, however, that once they eat all of the desirable plants that I prefer, they often will go to other plants like bromeliads, um, even anything else that they can find and they'll chomp on those if they run out of food. So uh, with grasshoppers, they start off as small nymphs and they are small black nymphs. They often will congregate on the blades of grasses or lilies or even plants in the evening. So when they're younger, that's the best time to control them. You can collect them. You can go out in the evening and see them all on top of a, on both sides of a, a leaf or a grass blade. And you can knock them off and collect them. Um, some people will take a, a bucket of soapy water and put them in that, that's fine too. The point is, is that they're easier to control when they're younger. And uh, you also, they don't like water. So if you were to spray the area with water, um, you'll kind of get them congregating and then it's easier to collect them. So the grasshoppers will eat a lot of desirable plants. It is something, you know, if I just have a few in my yard, I don't consider that to be a big deal, but I do try to go out in the evenings and uh, collect them when they're young nymphs. I've had some people, including coworkers, say that this is really good stress relief to deal with the grasshoppers in their garden, so. And there are different strategies that people can use. Um, sometimes, you know, the efficacy is here or there, uh, but you can try different things. That's one of the best parts about gardening is uh, it's an experiment. We all learn what works in our yards and we try new things and we learn and that's hopefully we have some fun along the way. Okay, so if you were to see these holes in the leaves of your rose bushes, for example, would you consider this to be good or bad? And really there's no, um, don't worry about, you know, having the wrong answer. Uh, we'll talk about it, but the point is just that we can kind of hear what your first impressions might be. All right, so I think we're about 50-50 with they're bad or they're not bad. So obviously we can see that there's evidence of chewing. We see these holes in the leaves and you can find these on rose bushes. I have some old garden roses in my backyard. So I find this all the time, um, typically on the new growth. And what this is, is as Betty has mentioned in the uh, chat box, this is a leaf cutter bee. So they are considered beneficial insects. Um, we do a lot to protect our bees and other pollinators. 
what they're actually doing is they're not trying to harm the plant. They're actually collecting a portion of the leaf. And then they use that to build uh, where they're going to lay their eggs and their larvae. So you can see a picture at the bottom of how they take those leaves. And I would maybe say non-scientifically, it's almost like putting shingles on a house where they're putting them together to create this space where they can put their, uh, they can, their larvae can grow. So it depends on who you speak to, but most of us will agree that um, in this case, the bees are considered beneficial. And I personally and many other gardeners will tolerate this and not do anything to control it. Now, if you were to see these holes on other plants, it could be evidence of a different chewing caterpillar or grasshoppers or something else. So the key is to kind of look for the evidence and see what they're doing and then try to identify the pest. So thank you everyone for adding your comments there. All right, here's our next critter that we're gonna take a moment to identify. What do you all think that this one is? <laughs> I see bad with uh, lots of exclamation marks. <laughs> yes, and Kelly, you are correct. This is an aphid, yes. So aphids can come in many different colors. They can be yellow, they can be creamy colored, they can be green, they can be brown, they can be reddish orange. Um, there are many different kinds of aphids. In fact, uh, if you wanna take this presentation a step further, you can do a web search for aphids and UF and find all different kinds of free publications online for aphids that you might encounter in Florida. So you can see on the left-hand side, the picture of the aphids on a squash or a melon plant. Um, aphids are very easy to identify because they have these uh, cornicles on their rear ends. And I don't know if you could see my cursor, you probably, you might be able to, but right there and right there are the two cornicles. Uh, when we talk to kids, we call them exhaust pipes. And if you were to look at any of these under a microscope or even a, a really easy hand lens, if you see those structures, you know you've got aphids. So uh, aphids are considered bad for many reasons. Um, they have those piercing sucking mouth parts. They'll pull out the nutrients of the plants. Um, they can cause discoloration. Um, one of the reasons why vegetable gardeners don't like them is because they vector diseases and they can transmit viruses. So not necessarily the best thing to have in your landscape, but they can be controlled by many different things. Because they have these soft bodies, um, you can use many uh, less toxic controls like insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils to control them. Uh, you'll also note that there are many predators, uh, good insects that feed on aphids. So if you were to look in your landscape and you start to see uh, aphids that almost look like a papery husk, or even if you have a small hand lens, um, I actually have a jeweler's loop that I think I bought online for $6. And you could take that jeweler's loop and uh, simply magnify different things that you see in your landscape. But if you were to see holes in some of these papery husks, then that's a clue that a wasp or some other predator has parasitized the aphids and basically made a meal out of them. So in this case, um, when people bring in samples from their gardens, if we were to see quite a few of these parasitized, then we might say, uh, let it go, see if the situation improves. It looks like you have a beneficial insect that's helping you with the pest problem. So very good to all of you who said that that is a bad aphid. And this is just a, new, a picture of a wasp parasitizing the aphids. And again, more aphid mummies. Looking at this picture, the ones that are more of the golden color are the ones that are alive. The ones that are brown and look like a papery husk, those are the ones that have been parasitized. So this is an example of where the majority of the aphids in this picture or on this leaf have actually been controlled by a natural predator. All right, here we have a wasp. So tell me if you think that this wasp is good or bad. And I understand that you may not know what wasp this is, but again, just kind of talking about first impressions and good bugs and bad bugs. So I have a few goods. I think you all are catching on. I see good with the question mark. <laughs> Actually, if, um, if many of you learn that wasps 
are good pollinators, that they do serve a function in our landscapes, and many of them do not harm us. They have important ecological roles. Um, that would be a great thing if most people learn that after this presentation. And uh, I know that some folks think that all wasps are bad. And sometimes I talk to kids when we do extension youth programs and they're very worried about getting stung or you know, they have this idea that you know, wasps are harmful. Many wasps are solitary. Um, they are excellent pollinators in our landscapes. And in fact, if you have a diversity of plants in your garden and you go out and you just kind of study the different insects that are coming to your plants, you don't have to know exactly what each species is, but you will notice that there are small flies, there are small wasps, you've got bees, you have butterflies. You may even notice that you have some different beetles that will come and uh, get the pollen and uh, be pollinators at your garden. So not all wasps would be considered pests. Um, this is actually a Lara wasp, and we consider this wasp to be a superstar. And the reason for that is because the Lara wasp is what we would call a biological control or a predator, and it goes after mole crickets. Mole crickets are a pest um, that will feed on the roots of turf grass, including bahia grass. And mole crickets are not necessarily something that you want tunneling through your lawn. So the, the Lara wasp will actually find the mole crickets in their burrows and they will lay their eggs on the abdomen, the soft belly of the mole cricket. And then of course the eggs hatch, they make a meal, they dispatch the mole cricket. And uh, this is considered a very good biological control for a pest. So in this case, uh, those of you who thought the wasp is good are correct. Here's a link to a YouTube video that was produced by the Entomology and Nematology Department with the University of Florida. And it talks about how to do a soap flush. I really love this technique because it's super easy and very inexpensive. Anyone can do it. And often if you're a home gardener, um, let's say even for turf grass that you know someone tells you that you have chinch bugs or mole crickets. This is a really good way to go out and actually see if you have them. You can see those insects with your eyes. Um, and if you don't find them, then in some cases it could be evidence of disease or uh, you know, fungus or another issue that you could get some assistance with. Remember, we want to properly identify the pest. We want to match the control to the problem. And this is a simple technique that home gardeners can do to try to find what might be in their lawns or landscapes. So I'll send you a link to this video. I'll also send you a handout on how to do the soap flush technique. This works great for turf grass and lawns, but basically you just take a gallon of water, a couple of tablespoons of a non-degreaser dish soap, uh, lemon scented works great, mix it up, pour it on different areas of your lawn and wait a couple of minutes, see what comes to the top. You might find things like earthworms, you might find earwigs, you might find chinch bugs, you could find mole crickets. If you don't find any pests, then you know, hey, let's look at some disease problems. Let's consider a fungus. If you find pests and you find a lot of them, then you can start to identify appropriate um, controls and solutions to get rid of them. So this is a really good uh, technique. It's super easy. I have sent this information to homeowners who have had issues with their turf grass and they've gone out and done this test even after they thought that there were insects or they were told that there were insects and they didn't find any. So it's a really great way to just be a, um, a, a consumer and understand what you, what you might have services that are being sold to you or to just double check things or to see what you have in your landscape. So you can match the pest and the uh, controls appropriately. Here's a, a critter that I like to mention to folks because it depends on who you're speaking with. If you're, if you're somebody who really likes citrus plants and might be growing citrus, you'll see this caterpillar on them. Uh, anyone know what this might be? And if you do, please go ahead and put your answer in the chat box. I do have a few folks who say it is a butterfly and uh, you are correct. It is a specific type of butterfly. I'll wait a moment to see if uh, any folks know what this is. Kelly is saying it's a swallowtail. Very good. Yes, it is a swallowtail. 
So this is a caterpillar that you might find on citrus plants. I know here in Florida, many of us aren't growing as much citrus as we used to because of citrus greening. But if you do have citrus, you might see this on the plant. If you have native plants like wild limes, or if you have um, Hercules club, which is a native uh, plant that also is in the same Rutaceae family, you might get these caterpillars on them. So people have called at the extension office and said, Nicole, my citrus plant is covered in little snakes. And um, these are not little snakes, they are little caterpillars, but when they're disturbed, the osmeterium or these little horns come out and then they go back when they're not disturbed, but they have a really bad smell like rotten fruit. So they are very ugly ducklings. They actually mimic bird droppings as a means of survival so that birds aren't eating them, but they turn into these beautiful giant swallowtail butterflies. So the egg is at the kind of the middle right hand side of the page. It's just an orange egg laid singly to a leaf, usually on the top of the leaf and on the new growth. And again, you can find these on citrus on the new growth. You can find them on wild limes. You can find them on Hercules club and uh, some other plants too, um, roof for example. So uh, then they hatch into the caterpillars and then the caterpillars will grow and develop and get a little bit bigger. The chrysalis is on the left, which looks like a piece of bark. If you touch it, it's very um, hard and it does feel like a twig, which I find really amazing that the camouflage is like this and they've mimicked and they blend into their environment so well. And then they emerge as the beautiful giant swallowtail butterfly. So uh, some of my friends, are, this is also known as the orange dog caterpillar and it can be a pest of citrus plants. But typically, if you've grown citrus and you're a home gardener, uh, you know you might only get a few of these caterpillars every so often. It's not a serious pest and it doesn't do enough damage to kill the plants. So this is one that I tolerate personally and actually encourage in my landscape. But again, uh, as I said earlier, many people do get concerned because they think that there are little snakes all over their plants. So um, remember, ident identification is very important. This is an earwig, and an earwig is a beneficial insect. They will eat lots of other insects. You could find them in turf grass. Uh, one time we did a soap flush at a homeowner's, in a homeowner's lawn, and the person thought that he had chinch bugs, but we didn't find any chinch bugs. We actually found a lot of earwigs, and we found a lot of earthworms. Um, so our initial thought was that he had a disease problem in his turf grass, and it actually ended up being a disease problem. Earwigs will eat lots of different insects, so they're considered beneficial and hopefully you can attract them to your garden. And I'm going to quickly go through the next because I know we're getting close to our time. I do want to mention I see some questions in the chat box and what we'll do after this webinar is we'll address any additional questions and a follow up email to you all. And again, I'll send out the links so you have access to all of this information that we've talked about. This is a, a this is actually a nuisance. It's not necessarily good and it's not necessarily bad, uh, but these are Jadera bugs. And the thing about Jadera bugs is they're very unique. They are linked with golden rain trees. So you'll see them a lot when golden rain trees are in bloom. And you might find these bugs all over the ground when the trees are in bloom. And someone sent me a private chat and I'm gonna go ahead and share it with you all that these are golden rain tree bugs and they have a ton of them. So the reason why we put this in the nuisance column is because really they're just there feeding on the seeds. And you can see how the picture on the right, the golden rain tree bug has put its mouthpiece into the seed and that is basically its food source. So what you can do in this situation is simply rake up the seeds and throw them in the garbage or dispose of them. By removing the food source, you decrease the likelihood that you'll have these pests all over your yard. And um, this is not something that you need to be as concerned about. So here we've properly identified the pest. We understand that they're attracted to the seeds. If we eliminate the food source uh, by raking up the seeds, we can eliminate the pest and we didn't have to use any pesticides. So no, no chemical controls are necessary in this case. <laughs> And you could see some information, some feedback from Michelle in the chat box on how she handled some of the golden rain tree issues in her landscape. All right, a few other um, 
beneficial insects. Have you all ever seen this picture on the left, these eggs on a structure around your yard, house, or garden? And if you have or haven't, just a simple yes or no in the chat box. All right. So I'm seeing some yeses and seeing some noes. One time I saw this on my car door and I thought, I can really appreciate you, but this is not the best place to lay your eggs. <laughs> I find these on fence posts. I find them on potting benches. I find them on, you know, clay pots, pretty much all over the yard. Garden hoses, they're prolific. You'll see these. You usually don't see the adult form as often, but you will today. So these are the eggs of, of I'm sorry, get some chat messages real quick. These are the eggs of lace bugs, lace wings. And you have brown lace wings and you have green lace wings. Lace wings are considered beneficial insects. You could see that picture on the right. They are eating something that we've already identified, which are aphids. These are red aphids with those, you could still see the black cornicles on their, on their rear ends. But the, um, the lace wings are beneficial. They eat a lot of different insects, white flies, thrips, um, mealybugs, and aphids, as you can see in this picture. Um, great insect to encourage in your landscape. So if you happen to see these eggs on the left-hand side, know that they will turn into lace wings and they are considered beneficial. And here's the green lace wing. This is the adult stage. Again, insects look very different at different stages of their life cycles. All right, and quickly going through a few more, I think you all can agree that the caterpillar on the left is considered a pest, but the egg sacs on top of the caterpillar are from a parasitic wasp. So if you were to find these eggs on a caterpillar, that is a good thing in your landscape. All of those little structures on the back of the caterpillar are parasitic wasps, and those are good wasps. They'll feed on the caterpillar and help to eliminate pests in your garden. And I put the picture on the right, just as a reminder of stink bugs. So I think most of us can agree that many stink bugs are considered pests, but did you know that there are good stink bugs and beneficial stink bugs? Um, and that reminds me, I'll send a link out to some a stink bug publication from the University of Florida that's very helpful for, you know, which stink bugs are helpful, which are harmful, and which are completely harmless, because there are some stink bugs that are totally harmless. So if you look closely at this picture, the one on the right, the black and the red stink bug has a very strong mouthpiece. Um, that one is the beneficial insect. The one on the left is considered to be the pest stink bug. So we do have some good stink bugs. And sometimes you can tell by their pointy shoulders, if they have pointy shoulders versus rounded shoulders, that it might be uh, more of a predator. Sometimes you can tell from the color. Um, most of the time you can tell from the mouthpiece, but I doubt very many of us are gonna be collecting them and looking at their mouthpieces. Uh, the point for this is just to know that we do have some good stink bugs and I'll send you some information on how to identify some in your landscape. We do consider spiders, now of course these are um, arachnids, but we do consider spiders to be beneficial. They eat a lot of different insects in the garden. So. Uh, sometimes folks are afraid of spiders. I know a lot of kids are afraid of spiders, but in general, spiders are considered to be very, very beneficial in the garden. And a few other um, insects. What do you all think about this one? Just at first glance, taking a look at this tiny wasp in the center. Good or bad? And remember, we've been talking about wasps quite a bit. Could be bad. I'm seeing some bad. It does have that really big red eye. I see some goods with question marks, so I know that you might be catching on. <laughs> All right, this is this is a superhero. This is another really good wasp, and this is a wasp that pretty much has a scientific name called Tamarixia radiata. And the reason why this wasp is considered beneficial is because it is attacking the Asian citrus psyllid that vectors the citrus greening disease. So this wasp is very, very, very small, so small. And what it will do is 
hunt or look for the Asian citrus psyllids and attack them. And here's a picture. Let me go ahead and find a picture of the psyllid. That is the psyllid, which is spelled P-S-Y-L-L-I-D. That is the Asian citrus psyllid that feeds on citrus plants and transmits the citrus screening disease. So this wasp will go after the psyllid. And in this case, it is a good insect and a, a, another example of biological control. All right, two plant things I wanna introduce you to. You might see this on different kinds of palms. The one on the left is a pygmy date or robolini. The one in the middle is a foxtail palm. And the one on the right is a triangle palm. These different um, kind of fuzzy structures on the palm, this is just part of the the morphological part of the palm. It is just like a frond or a leaf or root. It is part of the palm structure. So on the left in particular, that pygmy day palm, um, folks have sent me pictures that look exactly like this. And at first glance, it might look like a scale insect covering the palm, um, or it could look maybe like aphids in some cases or even disease. But this is just natural. It's called scurf. It's part of the palms. No chemical treatment is necessary. And oftentimes as the palms mature and get older, some of this will go away. Uh, so if you have a pygmy date palm in front of your house, your homework is to maybe look at some new growth. Or if you have a younger palm, see if you can find this and know that that is completely okay and harmless. The other one I wanna take a moment to mention to you all are lichens. Lichens get a bad rap. A lot of folks think that they are parasitic to plants, that they're killing trees, um, that they're harmful, that they're a disease or a fungus. They are not. They are actually very good at pulling out pollutants from the air. They just use the plants for support. If you do find these on a declining plant, look for other causes such as uh, soil compaction, too much water, the plant is just too old, it's old age, um, disease, something like that. Lichens aren't going to kill plants. Um, there's quite a lot of diversity about lichens, and uh, they are very good at cleaning our air. They're scientifically being studied for the ecological benefits that they provide, and they're even helpful for, you know, animals. So, for example, the picture on the right, you might find tiny little mites in there or different insects that could live around lichens, so they're a food source, um, or they provide habitat for a food source for other animals. They can provide nesting material for hummingbirds. And one of the things that I really think is fascinating about them is they actually can help to form soil because if they're on rocky areas over time and it takes a long time, they can really start to collect and form soil and sort of be the bedrock of um, you know, providing habitat in rocky areas. So I hope that you all appreciate lichens and uh, they are not something that you need to spray or try to scrape off or or spray a chemical on. Okay, keep an eye out for some other pests that have been newer to Florida. If you need any assistance, any extension office can help you with this. We have the uh, red bay and Borgia beetle, which we will be looking at, and it, it does cause some issues with avocados, um, anything in the Loraceae family. Um, very quick dieback, and it's something that you have to be careful about how you dispose of the wood in the trees. Unfortunately, in avocados, we really can't treat this. So something to keep an eye out for, this is considered a pest. And also we're studying the leaf hopper for lethal bronzing disease, um, formerly Texas Phoenix Palm to Climb. There are some excellent resources on this and how the scientists in, at UF are trying to figure out which leaf hopper is responsible for transmitting this disease. Um, if you have different palms and unfortunately, the list of, of um, host palms for this disease has increased. So I can send a link to that, but you really wanna just pay attention to the symptoms that you find and get some assistance early on if you notice decline in some of your palm trees or palms, I should say. <laughs> all right, so out of this presentation, my main goal is that you all have an appreciation for insects and pests. In, in quotes, because pests could be many things that we think could be a pest, um, such as fungus, lichens, uh, disease, insects. Know that most insects are beneficial or completely harmless to us. Very few are harmful. The practices that we do in our landscapes uh, affect 
insects, they affect our pollinators and other beneficial organisms. And identifying insects and being in your garden can be really fun. It's a lifelong learning process. None of us are gonna know everything in our yards and landscapes, but if we can have a little bit more appreciation and try to identify insects and learn a little bit more, um, then that's a good thing. And so if you all have any specific questions about this presentation, feel free to put it in the chat box and then I'll, I'll spend the next week responding to everyone individually. I believe we collected your email addresses. I really appreciate you all taking the time to be here. And please reach out to our extension Facebook page, our for friendly landscaping Facebook page. You know, get in touch with your local extension office. And remember that we're here to help you with lots of different um, gardening challenges and plant identification. And we have free information that we can send you to. <laughs> so I, I am seeing some comments that who knew wasps were good? Very good. <laughs> All right, I'm seeing some really great questions. So I'll be sure to follow up with folks individually. If there are some questions from the chat box that I think would be appropriate to the group, I'll go ahead and include that in my follow-up email. Um, you should have our contact information once we reach back out to you. So please let us know if there's uh, information that you need, or if you have an idea for a future topic and you want us to address that, let me know that too. Again, thank you everyone for being here today during your lunch time. Uh, I appreciate your feedback and um, great comments in the chat box. Thanks again for answering the questions.